Adesso Giuseppe Fanini, connect with uh, Teams. Allora, una cosa di servizio, Giuseppe, Mauro, se c'è bisogno di chiamarmi per qualunque motivo, eh, mandatemi un messaggio prima su WhatsApp perché le ca le, gli altoparlanti li tengo bassi perché ho, della, ho ecco delle qua. riunioni e delle cose, devo tenerla basso l'altoparlante. Grazie. Ok, ok. Allora, Giuseppe Falini, the, the title valorization of waste materials from fishing and the manufacture. Giuseppe Falini is professor uh, no for, for you and now connected with the uh, another preposition. Let's see. Okay. So, okay, okay. I, if you can see me because uh, I'm in full screen, I see only the screen. Okay. So, good afternoon. You can see me, Mauro? Yes. Yes, okay, yes. Okay, because I saw only the screen, I don't see myself. So, uh, good afternoon, I'm Giuseppe Falini, I'm a professor, as you can read here, at the University of Bologna, but right now I am serving as scientific attaché at the Italian Embassy in Tel Aviv. So, this is the reason why I cannot be in Fano, because uh, I am a bit far away from Fano. So, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, some valorization uh, strategies that we develop in our laboratory uh, to recover waste material from uh, fish and mariculture. So this is, I want to say, not the only activity that we perform in our lab. Uh, myself, in collaboration with Simona Fermani and recently also with the Dr. Davis Montroni, we study several topics. And uh, one of the topics that I want to talk is about biomineralization, and all these topics is performed in collaboration with uh, Professor Goffredo. Other topics, as you can see, are protein crystallography, uh, system for regenerative medicine and drug delivery. But in all this, what we do, we try to use waste materials, waste biological materials, so to add value to waste. And this is a Mauro. Can you hear me? There is some background from here. Yes, we can. Okay. So this is really a hot topic because nowadays there is a huge production of waste material from fishery, and you can see here that every year about six million tons of waste food are produced globally. This uh, seafood, uh, this waste seafood is a problem because uh, it's not well reutilized. If you want to uh, dispose of it, this is a cost. By example, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but in Australia it will cost around 150 uh, U US dollars per ton. In other countries where they don't, uh, they don't pay so much attention to the reuse or to the disposal process, usually they are dumped in landfill or on the sea, and this produces a lot of uh, uh, damage, bad, bad odors, and so on. So it's very important to find strategy to don't waste seafood waste. And this was really a topic you can see from that was reported years ago already in Nature, which is one of the most important scientific journals that we have in the literature. Now, why it's important don't waste waste? Because this uh, shell arbor useful chemicals. They are not, uh, they are made, everything is made of chemicals, but this waste contains chemicals that we can reuse. And uh, there are three primary uh, chemicals that uh, we can use and they, can, and they are of interest in, for the industry. So now uh, I will focus a bit on uh, mollusk shell. And if we consider mollusk shell, they are composite material that contain calcium carbonate, a bit of chitin, and a bit of protein. Don't, for, don't give uh, light to this statistic here, the percentage, because these are related to shrimps, and we will talk maybe later on about shrimps. Just pay attention to calcium carbonate that you can see is a material which is wide use, pharmaceutical, agriculture, paper industry, pigment, 
filler, soil treatment, rubber, plastic as filler. So it's very, it's an important material. We will see a bit more later on. So if you, but you can see these are oyster shells. We cannot use oyster shells. So we have to develop a sustainable way to refine and give value to this waste. And this, if we are able to give value, this can be really a source of a billion of dollars and it can generate a, a by economy. Just an insight, now I'm here in Israel, where Israel, as probably you know, is the startup country. There are, and they have also a lot of uh, startup that are, they, they get more than $1 billion. But not only startup, now is developing also new concept to become the uh, innovation country. So they want to bring the research to the society. And among the topics in the innovation uh, strategies, there is, by the way, the recover of waste material. Now, going back to calcium carbonate, why is important calcium carbonate? As you can see here, uh, there is a, a huge market. The market is about 28 billion. This is the market that is foreseen for the year 2027. The annual growth of the compound, compound to annual growth is about 6%. The market is worldwide. Of course, Asia cover a great part of the market, but this is more related to China. So when we say Asia, we'll see later on many in East China, but also in Europe, in North America, and also in other continent. So, in, what is used this calcium carbonate? I told you the seashell is made, is made primary of calcium carbonate. These are the different field of application. Paper, where you use as pigment, white pigment. Paint, again white. Uh, white pigment, plastics, and all the plastics is used as filler. Then is also added to adhesive and sealants, building construction, and there are other applications. Usually, this other application, they have high added value, and these are the, the most important. You know, we will see later on this. We have also to think another important issue that I think for you that they that uh, you have a really a multifaceted knowledge. When we are using new material, we have also to take in consideration the re government regulation that hampered the growth and the potential hazard of calcium carbonate. So it's not enough to produce a new material, but it's very important that this new material is approved by the uh, government regulation. Now, uh, calcium carbonate, it is wide application, but it's very simple material. So one can think there is still any interest to study calcium carbonate. You know, we can find calcium carbonate everywhere. So why to study? But if you can see here the, the number of publication till the year 2000, is an increasing number of publication. So it's still in a very hot topic from the scientific point of view. But not only this, also the number of patents is increasing. So there are more and more investment generation of intellectual properties using calcium carbonate. I told you that it's very important to find uh, application for calcium carbonate with high added value. And what in which field you can have a very high added value? Of course, when you are discussing about uh, high added value, the biomedical field is the reference because you know the cost of one gram of a drugs is a thousand of time higher compared to one gram of a mineral or a flower or any other compounds. But there are many other applications let's say in energy, for energy storing, so you convert in calcium oxide and then you reconvert in calcium carbonate. 
They are used also for environmental protection. So you can use, we'll see later for different other application. So there is room for new application for calcium carbonate. And if we want to develop this new application, we have to find also a different way to use calcium carbonate, not just a synthetic one. I was telling why different route, because the use of seashell can be a different route. Nowadays, calcium carbonate is basically obtained from quarries. In this case, you have an environmental problem, but also a visual impact, which is very negative. In other, and this is called ground calcium carbonate. To give you an idea, this ground calcium carbonate, it costs less than 10 euro per tons. Tons. So this means 1,000 kilos, to give you an idea. So 10 cent per kilo, uh, 100 cent per kilo. So really very low price. We can also you obtain calcium carbonate synthetically, chemically, and what is called precipitate calcium carbonate. Also in this case, you start from limestone. So you get limestone from here. What you do, you convert in calcium oxide. So you do thermal treatment. You get, when you convert calcium carbonate in calcium oxide, you, you get uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And this carbon dioxide can be reduced. From the calcium oxide, you add water. And this process, you can purify. This is the key point. The cave, the nature, is intrinsically dirty. So it's not pure. You have other mineral, other uh, contaminants, species. But here, you can uh, purify calcium oxide. You get calcium hydroxide. You, you clean the gases. You have, you have only CO2 only carbon dioxide, no other gases. Then you have reactors. You mix up calcium hydroxide and ca carbon calcium hydroxide and carbon dioxide. So you get again what is called ca precipitated calcium carbonate. And the big advantage of precipitated calcium carbonate respect to ground calcium carbonate is the purity, but not only the purity, because controlling the reaction you can get calcium carbonate with different shape and different particle size. The particle size is really a key issue because as smaller as better. If you reduce the particle size, the value increases exponentially. So these two are the traditional source of calcium carbonate. But as I told you at the beginning of the lecture, you can have calcium carbonate from many other sources. Here I report a lot of seashells, but also eggshells are made of calcium carbonate. Carbonate. So, and if you think the market of shell, we are mil, a billion of eggs are used every year around the world. Billion and billion. If you think each one of us, I think, is using about 100 eggs per year, directly or indirectly. So not just eating eggs, but in the, eating biscuit, cakes, and so forth. So there are ways, all these are waste material, that can be used as a source of calcium carbonate. The calcium carbonate, which is associated to these materials, is not, it doesn't come from a geological process. It's calcium carbonate, it's called from a biological process. So it has features that are biological control. So there is a control of organisms. They came from a biological process, and there the cells govern the growth of calcium carbonate in all these examples. And one of the most uh, uh, difference between synthetic or geogenic calcium carbonate and the biological one is that the organisms are able to control the shape and the aggregation of the crystal. So the morphological aspect change drastically when you move from the biological to the abiological one. Now, uh, calcium carbonate, probably you know, it exists in three different polymorphs. 
calcite, aragonite, and batrite. These are the three main polymorph, crystalline polymorph. Then there is also amorphous calcium carbonate. Aragonite, now, if you are going to distribute, to see the distribution of this polymorph, aragonite is abiologically quite rare, but it's very common in biological world. Calcite is very common in biological world in, abiologi in, in the abiological one. Vaterite are rare, and someone believes that it doesn't exist in biological in our biological world. Dolomite is a very rare in biological world, almost doesn't exist, but it's very common in the biological one. The geological dolomite is widespread. Our harps are very rich, the Italian harps are very rich of dolomites. Amorphous calcium carbonate, which is a different polymorph, no crystalline, so amorphous, doesn't have a crystalline structure of calcium carbonate, is very common in biological world, but completely absent in the geological one. So these are the distribution of the calcium carbonate mineral phase between the biological world and the abiological one. But now I want to that you put attention on this uh, image. These are photos, while this one are uh, scanning electron microscope image. Now, this is calcium. This is aragonite, this is a crystal of aragonite from Ar Morocco. And this is how aragonite appear in the mollusk shell. In this case, is in Atrina rigida. This is a, a crystal of calcite, geological one. And these are the crystal of calcite that are present in the Mitrus californianus, the mussel that we usually found in our beach. This is, it was supposed to be a crystal of aragonite, uh, sorry, of vaterite, and this out appear vaterite in the otolites of the fish, Chondrostroma natus natus. So I think the difference is really striking. So you, I have to say also an anecdote about this crystal. This I bought in Entraco, which is a place close to Torino, and the shape is the one of vaterite, but it's not true vaterite because it's converted completely in calcite. For this I said that vitrite abiologically is very rare and probably doesn't exist at all. So I paid for a vitrite, but really it's calcite. So I didn't did I didn't great business. Well, let's go ahead. I want to show to tell you also some uh, uh, difference between the three main crystalline polymorph of calcium carbonate. This because uh, it will be important to, un in the, to understand how high is the biological control when the organisms are, are able to differentiate aragonite and calcite. In the organism, when differentiate a polymorph, they do in a specific way. In biological world, some polymorphs can be one close to the other, but never mix it together. So the organism is able to have an level a, a very high control over the polymorphism. And this control occurs with high fidelity. The Atrina rigida, we have always this crystal of aragonite, all with the same thickness. In the Mitrus californianus, we will find always this crystal of calcite, always with the same organization, the same shape. They don't change. The biological control govern the formation of this mineral, or how we usually call biomineral. Now, to give you a better idea of how high is biological control, I'm showing here the crystalline structure. Don't be afraid, it's nothing really difficult. These are the unit cell, but it's not important for you to have this crystallographic knowledge. But you can see we have a layer of calcium ion, which are the yellow spheres. This one, the red, small red sphere, are the carbonate, uh, the oxygen, and the gray one is the, car the carbon. So this is one carbonate ion, and this is one calcium ion. If we are going now to see the structure of calcite, what you can see that we have a layer 
of carbonate, a layer of calcium, a layer of carbonate, a layer of calcium, and so forth. So we have layered calcium and layer of carbonate. If we are going to see now, to see now the structure of aragonite, it's basically the same, layer of calcium, layer of carbonate, layer of calcium, layer of carbonate, layer of calcium, layer of carbonate. So the structure differs really in few aspects. And nevertheless, the organism is able to specifically control the formation of this phase, of this phase. If we do, if we do is uh, synthetically, what we find is always a mixture of these two phases. Aragonite, uh, vatrite, which is uh, the third polymorph, you can see it has different organization. This is from the crystallographic point of view, is really an interesting material because you can see the carbonate ions are distributed in different positions, so are mobile, it's kind of are rotating in this structure. But also in this case, you have a layer of calcium, layer of carbonate, sorry, layer of calcium, layer of carbonate, and so forth. So to have pure this material is something that the nature knows how to do, but not always synthetically is possible. Another uh, important feature that we have to keep in mind. You can see here there are some crystallographic information regarding this three mineral phase, but I want to that you put attention on the density, the mass volume ratio. What you can see, site there's density 2.71, aragonite 2.93, and vatrite 2.54. So this is the lighter, this is the heavier, if you have the same volume. So this can be some effort when you use the different polymorph. And this polymorph, having a different crystalline structure, they have also different solubility. So the release of calcium and carbonate ion when you dissolve this polymorph is completely different. The less st stable is vatrite, the most stable is calcite. So if you put in water vatrite, with the time it will convert in calcite. Aragonite is a, an intermediate stability, but the conversion from aragonite to calcite is synthetically very slow. So aragonite can stay water for years without converting in calcite. Of course, since calcite is the most stable from the thermodynamical point of view, if you eat vitrite and aragonite to high temperature before the decomposition of calcium carbonate, both these polymorphs convert to calcite. So I think, I hope that I gave you a, a basic idea of the feature of these three polymorphs. And now what we are going to do is to move to the use of shell as a source of calcium carbonate. Keep in mind that the shell we have calcite and aragonite. Some shells are made only of calcite, other shells are made only of aragonite, and when these both phases are co-present, they are in different layers. They are not mixed. Now, if we want to use calcium carbonate from seashell, we have also to think if we have enough material. And here now I am reporting the production of uh, uh, seashells, how it is increasing around the world. And in, in this, this map, you have the main producer of seashells. Now you can see here this, the diameters of these circles is proportional to the percentage of production around the world. Now the East Asia is governing the production of seashells, and China, as usual, you can see, uh, represent almost 83% of the global production. So China is, the, as in many other fields, is the bigger producer of uh, mollusks from aquaculture.
Here is a, a different view of the diagram. This is China. We are not anymore as a percentage, but is as tons. You can see in China globally, the production is reported to be above 10 million tons. And then we have our other country. This is Italy, where the production compared to China is very small. But let's now to concentrate to Italy because we, uh, the majority of you are Italian. This is the country where we were born. So this is the, the production of different uh, shellfish species in Italy. You can see that it's not constant along the years. There's been a slight reduction, but the muscle are the species that represent the majority of the production. The production of clams was uh, quite high about 20 years ago, but now it's, it decreased and now it's almost stable. And the, uh, the production of oyster as thousands of tons is uh, almost nothing. I think there are only few a few hundred of tons of uh, mussel of oyster produced from aquaculture every year in Italy. There are questions? Mauro, can I go ahead? Yes, please, no question. Okay. Now, if we want to, uh, to recover waste shell, we have to make some kind of conceptual uh, path. And the star here indicates where are the key point for the recover of seashells. So we have mollusk from aquaculture because from aquaculture, we don't have seashell. We have the, the mollusk, which means the shell with the meat. We have to harvest, and this is uh, quite easy. You have also to consider that from all mollusk aquaculture, between 15 and 20% of the product are not good for the commercialization. So they are discharged. Also, it can be a good source of material. You have to harvest them. And then when you are harvested, of course, you lose some of them during the sorting and the harvesting. So you have a loss of material. This is another key point. But then you have to remove the meat because you don't want the meat with the calcium carbonate. This is difficult to storage and then give problem. Usually what you do, you, dry, you have to remove the meat, you use a sucking process, you dry, and then you process. Or what you can do after you harvest. You clean the shell by depuration, and then the shell itself can be also used. Let's say sold to restaurant. You can process, and you can also sell, you can process a cooking, and then you can use it in a completely different way. So all this path can come from the mollusk aquaculture until the product that we sold, they are sold to the supermarket. So only some of this path can give finally a good use of waste mollusk shell. Because one of the main problem that you have is to recover mollusk shell. You know, the majority of the mollusk shell are used by consumers in their family. And there is all they are using the restaurant. Only a small part of the mollusk shell goes to tinned or can are tinned or canned. So only in this path you have a source of shells. All from the ones that are no good for commercialization. So around the world, there are several programs where they try to recover mollusk shell. And to recall, so main, the majority of mollusk shell is world production, as I told you, are oyster. If we can see, oyster is the species that are more produced. So there are several programs that are trying to recover oyster and to reuse oyster, let's say to make barrier, or they put in the recycle shell to work. 
they spray to dry. They make this monumental amount of oyster shells. There are some islands in Venezuela that are completely covered of a, a seashell. So they call it the, the cemetery of seashell. So there are places where you can collect seashell, but the main problem is to find a right path to recycle seashell. And for the future, we would like to reutilize seashell to make barrier, to make new materials. Now, uh, in the next slides, what I'm showing you are some uh, application that we propose for C recycling waste shell. Is a, one project that was presented was to use artificial reef to make artificial reef to buffer New York. And this artificial reef can be made using oysters. Why? Because they believe it by, that the next 40 years, the sea level will, ra will rise up to a third of a meter. And this will threaten coastal cities, including also New York. So they, they think that without uh, some action, 21% of uh, the predictions say that 21% of lower Manhattan will be inundated. So it's very important to make a barrier to protect our city in the future. And the more they make a defensive bar barrier, they thought it's possible to reconstruct reefs. And these reefs can be reconstructed using oyster shells. So this is a long time project as we presented. It was also published in Nature, you can see. So there was an opinion in nature. So it's not something that came out without any uh, scientific background. The uh, waste seashell can be also a source of a different uh, inorganic material, because when you crush and calcinate this material at about 900 degree, what you get basically is almost completely calcium oxide. But if you are going to see, according to the source, the difference, the content of calcium oxide change. And this is once more something which is a biological control. So if you want almost pure calcium, car, uh, calcium oxide, you will use cookers. If you want less calcium oxide and more additional other component, you use oyster and so on and so forth. So basically you can control the composition of what you get according to the organism. But we can go also further because it's not only the organism, all the trace element are controlled by the, the site of farming. So according to the chemistry of seawater, you can have a different concentration of trace element. And this, of course, will affect the physical and chemical property of the material that they are using and the potential application. I was mm. telling you so far that uh, uh, seashells are formed under a very strict biological control. And that when you have a different mineral phase, aragonite or calcite, they are always layered, they never mix together. Now, what I'm showing here is the structure of a, a common uh, shell that they are in the Pacific coast, the abalone rufations. This abalone, you can see, is made by an external layer of calcite. We discuss only the mineral phase. Then we have an, a nacreous layer, which is made of aragonite. And this is the, the tablet-like structure. We will go ahead, we will see later on this tablet-like structure. Then we have another layer of calcite. And then you have, again, a layer of aragonite, of nacreous aragonite. So this is the mantle, 
here are the cell. So the cell control the formation of this mineral phase. And as you can see here, the cell decides when to grow calcite, when to grow aragonite, when to grow an intermediate layer of calcite, and also how to deposit the organic phase, which are associated to this mineral. Because one of the key features of seashells is that I told you so far that are biominerals. But biominerals does not mean that are only produced by organs, but also means that inside the shell, between the mi among the mineral layers, there is organic material. And this organic material is usually made of polysaccharide and protein. So the cells not only deposit the mineral phase, but also deposit polysaccharide protein. And the interaction between the polysaccharide and protein and the mineral phase generate this very high organized structure. So you have the cell mantle, so you can see here, the extra pallial space, here there is a fluid. In this fluid, the mineral phase is formed. As you can see here, here the nacre, tablets are growing. If you are going out to see a bit higher magnification, each nacre tablet is surrounded by an interlamellar membrane. So there are uh, protein and polysaccharides. And also inside each tablet, there is organic material. So what it is clear that the organ is able to control the texture, the shape, the orientation of the crystal, but also the deposition of the organic material that in some way bridge and glue the different tablets or different fibers of calcium carbonate. Aragonite in the first phase, calcite in the second phase. I was telling you that the organisms are able through the presence of the organic material to control the texture, the organization of the mineral phase. And for this, I'm again showing you a comparison between geological calcium carbonate, in this case calcite, and the biogenic one. This is a big crystal, it can be a few centimeters. If you are going to see the surface of this crystal with the at very high magnification, which a technique is called atomic force microscopy, and probably some of you know this technique, this is how to appear the surface. You see? Sorry. You have here these patterns. These are the growing phase. Here is a growing layer. But when we are going to see the structure of the mollusk, for instance, as I showed you before, Here, you have all these fibers. So completely different structure. And this fiber, as you can see here, they are all, all almost the same diameters, the same orientation. So it's highly a process which is highly controlled. This is a magnification. This is the external layer, which is organic, the periostracum, and this is the prismatic layer, which are under the periostracum. So we are observing the external layer of a mass. The internal layer is made of aragonite. These are the tablets of aragonite. I, I just said to you that between this layer and inside this mineral layer, there is of organic material which is absolutely absent in the geological one. So one of the add value of biogenic calcium carbonate respect to geogenic or synthetic one is that the entrapped inside the biogenic, the biogenic one, there is an organic material. And only nature's organism, only the biology knows how to do this. These are a series of images 
where you can see what's happened. Here are all the prism is in a, a pinna trina rigida. These are mineral phase. If you remove this, this is a view from the top, and this is an higher magnification between these layers, this prism. You can see each single tablet here, single prism. Now, what's happen if you start from this material and you remove the mineral phase? So you leave only the organic. This is what we obtain. This is the phanto of the organic phase. You can see inside this void, there was the mineral phase. Now, if you remove the organic, only the mineral phase remain. And this will obtain this black boundary region. It's place where there is nothing. And then you can see also there is also a secondary structure. So when, when, you, when you remove the mineral phase, you have also this layer. So what means that you have a mineral phase also inside this prism? And if instead, if you take one of these prism and you dissolve, you can see a network of mineral, of organic material. So the organic material is intracrystalline, but also intercrystalline. Uh, can I go ahead? Any question from the audience? Unfortunately, I cannot see you. So no questions from the audience. Okay, thanks. So we go ahead now. If we are discussing about the valorization of the shells, we cannot forget the fact that the shell has been used since the antiquity. I mean, shell has been found in cave where uh, prehistorical uh, humans were living. So they have a very uh, high value as decoration. You can see, oh, they were used in the past as money. So this shell are from we're found in China, and as you can see they are almost one thousand year BC, and this symbol were indicating the value of the different shell. So the shell had a value by themselves since the past. They were used by the Indians of the North America to make this decoration wampums. So the men and the shell is. The evolution of the man in some way is always a core with the shell. So the shell are relevant also in the history. And I think the history is a witness of the importance of the shell. As I wrote here, also the Neanderthal were using shells, probably for decoration. But nowadays, we don't use shell for decoration. So how waste shell are used when they are not dumped or discharged? The main use of a mollusk shell is as feed for poultry or nutrition for pet bird. In this case, the shell are eaten. It is for regulatory process. So you destroy all the organic material at around 300 degrees, and they are served. You can see the cost change between three and seven euro per kilogram, which is much, much higher if you think compared to the cost that I told you regarding calcium carbonate, the geogenic calcium carbonate, the one from query, as I told you, is 10 euro per tons, which means 1,000 of kilogram. These are the two main use nowadays. They don't cover a big market. Then they sometimes they are also used as biofilter, some aquarium or pond pH buffer for soil liming, and as shell aggregate. When you use as biofilter or some liming, in all these cases they are heated and crushed or powdered. And when you put in aquarium, you have also to wash with chlorine to remove basically to oxidize all the organic material and remove it. When you use also as a soil liming, you'll see later, of course, the cost became much lower because you use higher amount. 
When you use a shell aggregate, also the cost is very low. And also is both dried or dried and crushed. So the cost in some way related to the market, but it's very low. And it's, even if it's quite low, it cannot compete with the actual cost that we have uh, from calcium carbonate from queries. So it's important to find a different application and application that can, have, that can have a higher added value. I have also to say that when this calcium carbonate is used as a livestock supplement, supplement I don't know now why, I'm, I apologize that in this computer, I'm using a computer here in the embassy, it changed a bit the font, but I think you can still read. Mauro, can you read? Yes, uh, oh. there is an overlap of the text. Yeah, but I I will correct this when I will give you the. This depends because I change computer, but when you have the right computer, I will send you the PDF with no overlap. OK, OK, no problem. Thank you. OK, so. Uh, as livestock feed supplement, usually. Uh, seashell are used as a source of calcium. And the, the majority of material, the shell that are used are oyster as natural. And, but what has been observed so far, that uh, uh, the, organ, the, the organism didn't have a huge advantage in using seashells of mined calcium carbonate. So the, the, the results, the quality, the, uh, of the egg that were produced were exactly the same. Some, in some papers, their reports a slightly better quality of the eggs, but is not absolutely uh, uh, demonstrated. And there are many conflicting results in the literature. So when we give to the hell uh, calcium carbonate as a source of calcium for the production of egg shells, it doesn't matter if you use calcium carbonate from uh, queries of calcium carbonate from seashell. Of course, there is a, a political environmental advantage because if you use calcium carbonate from seashell, you are recovering a waste. As I was telling you, there are some one that uh, say that if you use the one, uh, <clears throat> the zebra mussel, you can have a better uh, quality, but this is uh, you have also to consider that sometimes you have some invasive species and you don't know how to use this all this biomass. So in this case, it's an additional advantage to use this biomass because these invasive species are colonizing the sea and you want to remove them and you don't know how to use. And not always, not always the meat uh, is uh, eatable or they have a good taste. And uh, you can uh, recover the meat as a source of protein, but this is co it is is costly, and sometimes the meat from uh, uh, mussel shell is a source of protein is not so rich of uh, protein because, as I told you before, we have also polysaccharides. So the use of uh, the material from mussel shell as a livestock feed supplement is an open discussion and so far doesn't present an economical advantage at least unless you don't consider that you are recovering a waste and for this i told you before it's very important the regulatory process i mean if the in government said you cannot make any more queries because you are devastating the environment you have a very bad vision uh, visual impact. So in this case, the the value of the shell will increase drastically because there are no there is no competition. These are also the same when you use a seashell as lining agent in agriculture. If you have a, a soil which is too much acidic, you want to reduce the acidity of the soil. 
So in this case, what you do, you put calcium carbonate or calcium oxide, and the calcium oxide is usually this calcium carbonate or calcium oxide are from eggshell or oyster shell. You put in land application, you neutralize the land. So I remember you that calcium carbonate is an alkaline compound. So if you put in acidic environment, they reduce the acidity. And this is the way to reduce calcium carbonates. So you avoid to use uh, other lime. You recycle this waste to increase the alkalinity of the soil. This is, is a process that is done. You can see this example in the US where they use, this is a, uh, some crop that were grown in a lime uh, soil, and this is an unlimed soil. You can see the quality of the crop is much better in the limed soil. You can ask me, can we use uh, ca georgenic calcium carbonate to this process? Yes, you can do, and the effect will be exactly the same. The small advantage is some researchers reported that when you use eggshell of uh, and also uh, waste calcium carbonate, if you don't do the calcination process, but you go directly to soil neutralizing, in this case, what you obtain, you have also proteins, small amount of protein, but, yes, but still you have a source, and the protein means a source of nitrogen for agriculture. So here in these figures, you can see the correlation between the, the pH how the pH was changed and the concentration of different calcium carbonate that we're using. You can see the different, the to get the, same, the similar effect, you have to use different uh, shell source. And this is a process, a flow salt that was proposed to produce calcium oxide as a uh, liming agent. But we have always to consider that in all this process, you are thermally treating the shells. So if you thermal treat the shell, you have a higher request of energy, and by the way, you produce calcium, uh, carbon dioxide. So there are some other disadvantages. An advantage that you can have and uh, from uh, using seashells, as I told you in advance, each calcium carbonate, it has its own solubility. And usually the seashell are a bit more soluble compared to the geogenic calcium carbonate. This means they are more uh, willing to exchange cation which are present in solution. So this, in this case, you can use treated soil with, uh, let's say, some uh, copper uh, contaminants to remove copper from the soil because the copper will form will form copper calcium carbonate so it will be adsorbed by the soil and the same can be done uh, if you have uh, uh, different source both in alkaline environment in the acidic soil. The core, you say, where the copper came from in agriculture? The copper is widely used uh, in, the, in agriculture to uh, protect the plants from fungi. All uh, the grapes are usually treated with huge amount of copper, and the majority of this copper goes in the soil. We have also to say that the calcium carbonate, it has also the capability to remove arsenic, which is a natural contaminant from soils. There are some regions in Romania and also in Italy that are naturally rich in arsenic. So it's important to remove the arsenic from the soils. Also in this case, the use of waste, of waste shell, the calcium carbonate from waste shell can help to remove arsenic and copper. Calcium carbonate has been also historically used 
as construction material. And these are many examples where calcium carbonate is used as aggregate in the mortar. Here we have example, this is in a temple from the Ming dynasty that was almost completely built with calcium carbonate, some mortar. This is the tabia material that was used in the US. And this is a modern structure which is built using seashell. So the concept of using West seashell in construction is no one because the history testified the use as a long time. But unfortunately, right now is used only as <clears throat> an aggregate material. So like you use small stone. So it's not used in a, it's not having an acting role in the construction. The acting role is given by the cement, which is usually a Portland cement. And this is something that we should, the death potential to improve the use of calcium carbonate from seashells. There are other construction material. You can see here all these blocks contains grain of oyster inside. There are some studies that show that these blocks are more resistant to uh, compression, but there are other studies that they show exactly the opposite. So it's very difficult to say if the seashell they have a real view in improving the mechanical property or the bricks that are built up using them. In the main case, the seashell has the role to, has to be a substitute for sand in the mortar. So that they don't, don't provide a clear synthetic advantage or a mechanical advantages. Which are the seashells that are mainly used as uh, additive, as inert, as aggregate in cement? Snake, cockles, these are the main one. These are some reference if you want to approximate. But as you can see, the compressive strengths, the mechanical property of the cement that, you, that has been prepared is changed. It appears to change a lot, but Honestly, they are not much better than when you use calcium carbonate, uh, the geogenic one. But it's important to see that according to the source of the shell, you have different compressing strength. And this for, is related mainly to the texture of the crystal. As I showed you before, when you have a different organisms, each organism, they produce crystal with a specific shape in morphology that have nothing to do with the biological one. I told you a few minutes ago that in agriculture, seashells are used to purify the soil from copper and arsenic, but it's been also used for the separation of pollution from wastewater and air. And the principle, here I reported you some example, is exactly the same. All acidic materials can interact with calcium carbonate. They are adsorbed on calcium carbonate. And so I, the calcium carbonate <coughs> is a, an active substrate for removing uh, the pollutants. In some case, to improve the porosity, and the capability of removing pollutants, calcium carbonate is converted to calcium oxide. Calcium oxide is more reactive of calcium carbonate. It has also an higher uh, porosity, so it means more surface, as you can see here. So this means higher capability of absorption. But please keep in mind that to convert seashells, waste seashells, in calcium oxide, you have to use energy you have to bring the temperature to about 800 degrees. And as I told you before, you uh, produce carbon dioxide. They can be used in different process, but you produce carbon dioxide. This is a flow chart of a process that's being developed by a company, create waste shell, you wash, you mechanical treat, 
you thermal treat, use calcium oxide, and then you may kind of filter basal calcium oxide. So the, the polluted air or the polluted water goes through this filter, and then you can recover the material. So you can use, there are applications, these fears are used nowadays. One of the features that I didn't say you before, that this kind of sphere, you, you, you get using only waste calcium carbonate. You cannot use, you cannot get this porosity, this structure using geogenic one. And this porosity came because inside this material, there is, inside this shell, there is organic material with high temperature undergo to pyrolysis and it goes away. So this is a feature that you can get only with seashell. And once more, you take advantage of the uh, presence of organic materials, intracrystalline and intercrystalline organic material. As I told you many times, the real added value of calcium carbonate. These are other examples for separation of pollutant from wastewater and air. Here they were able to remove uh, copper, zinc, brown, lead. And in all cases, what you, you have absorption of these uh, pollutants on the material, on the calcium carbonate. And you can see what's happened here. Along the time, you have this kind of Langomir uh, isotherm profile of absorption. So the amount of pollutant that is absorbed after a certain time reaches the plateau. And this absorbent process is related to the formation of new mineral phase. Mineral phase that contain this pollutant. The sericide that you get here is lead calcium carbonate. You can get also cadmium calcium carbonate and so forth. The researcher observed some different when they were using oyster shell and razzle clam shell. But this difference, once more, is due to the fact that we have different texture in, different, in this shell. So the reactivity is different. And another big difference is the razzle clam shell is made of aragonite, while the oyster shell are made of calcite. So we have also different polymers, so different reactivity. This material was also characterized by other technique, and it was clearly showed, this is the case of cadmium, that cadmium is absorbed in this mineral. These are uh, infrared spectra that show the formation of the different mineral during the absorbent process, and they also uh, consider the idea that if you use the shell itself without any thermal treatment, the organic materials, which is entrapped inside the shell, can help the absorption process. So you don't have only, not only the conversion of calcium carbonate in a different mineral, but also a collating effect related to the presence of the intracrystalline organic material. Calcium carbonate, we will see later a bit more, is widely used also as a filler in polymers. But the, when they use nowadays calcium carbonate as filler, the main use of the filler is to produce, to, to increase the weight. So the filler needs only to increase the weight and to reduce the formula cost. So you use less polymer, and so the polymer is the material that costs a lot, so you don't want to use too much polymer. In this case, you, uh, you use calcium carbonate as filler. There are some studies that clear that when you use bio-based calcium carbonate, you have an increase of the temperature of uh, stability. Is called glass transition when the polymer goes uh, to a different structure, but I don't want to go this in the detail, but you have an increase in stability of the polymer. This increase uh, reaches limits 
when you have a, a concentration of about 50% of the polymer, if you put higher concentration, the polymer start to aggregate, the, the mineral start to aggregate and you have uh, unpleasant side effect. This I will explain to you a bit later. Another application that is being considered for calcium carbonate is, uh, is uh, uh, the iser grit, this is a substitute of sodium uh, chloride. So nowadays, calcium carbonate is used also to this, as the iser grit. This can be a bit uh, better than sodium chloride, you, because in this case, the calcium carbonate it has lower solubility, so you bring less uh, ion in the environment, and so you reduce the ionic strains and all the negative uh, effect that uh, ionic strains can have. Some uh, application has been has been proposed, but so far so far unrealized. Let's say green roofing substrate, so you can use calcium carbonate to be the roof of some houses, and then as substrate, and then you maybe we can use also to grow plants to give a different architectural perspective. You can also use, you can produce calcium oxide, you bring back in the in the in seawater, and then you can reduce the acidity of seawater. All this potential and unrealized application of calcium carbonate are so far quite questionable because in any case here you have to produce calcium oxide, so you are releasing CO2 in the atmosphere. They have been used also to produce a substrate where uh, oyster and the coral can grow. This was also part of the project a few years ago we were working, but also in this case the application are, are limited to few cases. So there is no big amount of application. Now, these are a table that in some way summarize all the application I showed you and adds additional application. And this additional application are in catalysis. So calcium oxide can be used also in the catalysis for produce biodiesel, for instance. These are basically unrealized applications. So all this application has to be uh, clearly still demonstrated. You can see this paper are not new when it was proposed this application, but no one of them has been so far presented. So it's, I don't want to I want to give you an example of what it can be done, but it's still to be performed. One uh, potential application of high interest and where there is an incredible uh, added value from the economical point of view, if it's for production for the production of material for biomedical application. In this case, you can see here calcium uh, carbonate as we convert to calcium phosphate. A calcium phosphate is the material that is used by our organism to build up our bone and our teeth. So if we can convert calcium carbonate in calcium uh, phosphate, we give an impressive additional value. And I want to stop uh, to, to talk too much of this because I will go deeper in these topics later on during the lecture. So in conclusion, for this first part of the lecture, mollus, in mollus or cartoon, we shall remain a barrier to sustainable growth. Shell are a majority calcium carbonate with small amount of organic matrix, but we saw this organic matrix as an important and crucial role, and this is the added value compared to the geogenic and synthetic calcium carbonate. The use of shell as an eco-friendly road acid substance, or they're using green roofing structure as functional drain layer, it is clear that there are many potential ways shell uses that do not require high energy processing such as pyrolysis. Where shell are producing a significant volume, it should be possible to find an appropriate valorization strategy for them. A close enough proximity 
to make it both sustainable and economically viable. The significant cost of a proper landfill disposal in many parts of the world, clean shell which cannot be used in any application that could be returned to the marine environment in a direct manner, where there can have a myriad of positive effects in the environment. It is important that the way we view shell change from nuisance waste to a valuable commodity that could provide economical and environmental benefit if usually and correctly utilized. So with this, I stop the first part of the lecture. Mauro, I don't know if you make a break or you go or straight on. Mauro, are you still there? Uh, Professor, this is Mariana. If it's okay, we usually do 15 minute break. Okay, we make 15 minute breaks and then we will meet again in about 15 minutes, okay? Okay, thank you.
Mauro ci sei? Professore, facciamo un piccolo annuncio e poi ci siamo. Va bene. bene. Perché come vi ho detto io sono un po' legato ai tempi qui dell'ambasciata, quindi non posso fermarmi a lungo. Anche al fuso orario che è diverso. Professore, siamo pronti, quando lei vuole. Benissimo, Mauro, ciao. Riparto? Sì, sì, può ripartire. Bene. Allora, eh, dopo questa prima parte di carattere... Uh, sorry, after the first part of the lecture that was in kind of a, a general introduction in the use of calcium carbonate, what I'm going to present you now is a project that we developed in the University of Bologna with other colleagues. And this project was uh, uh, to uh, use and to produce advanced material using biogenic calcium carbonate from waste seashell. This is a project that was granted by the European community. I already told you about this. Which kind of seashell source we use? And now we go in the specific, it's something we didn't see. So we use oyster that are made of magnesium calcite. Is calcite with an isomorphic substitution of magnesium to calcium around the three atom percent. Then we use a scallop. In this case, the atomic substitution of uh, magnesium to calcium is about six atom percent. So what means they are both made of calcite, that we know very well calcite right now, but in one case, there is 7% of magnesium ion in the place of calcium, and here only 3%. So these two are different material. This percentage of calcium of magnesium is always the same. It doesn't matter where the oyster came from, it doesn't matter where the scallop came from. And this is quite impressive. You consider that in seawater, the, the amount of magnesium is almost five times higher respect to that of calcium. Then we use also clams, waste clams, and the clams are made of pure aragonite. So we have calcite, calcite, aragonite. These are the structure of the, the prisms that are present in the oyster shell, and this is the nake structure which is present in the scalp. But as you can see here, this nake makes a lot of tablets that are all cast on the top of each other, and also in this case we can clearly see the organic matrix, the intercrystalline organic matrix. So We have intracrystalline organic matrix, I'll show you before, and this is the added value. This is what makes the difference between the geogenic and the biogenic calcium carbonate. So how we can valorize waste seashell? So we use different uh, strategies. One of the strategy was the amorphization. So to use calcium carbonate from seashell. I told you that usually it's less stable and more soluble with respect to the geogenic one, and to convert this calcium carbonate from the crystalline phase to amorphous phase. But I'm not going to discuss this today. 
we produce, we can do chemical and physical functionalization. We can convert in electrical conductive materials, take advantage of the presence of uh, the organic matrix. It can be converted by to calcium phosphate. And if we use specific condition, it can be converted almost in ambient condition. This means low pressure, low temperature. And I told you before that when we convert calcium carbonate in calcium phosphate, we, we give an additional value. And then we also test calcium carbonate with a company, FIM project, as polymeric additive for compounds. Now I will go to show you all this application so you can get the feeling of what we produce. The first step we have to do, you have to develop a, a synthetic a treatment process to convert shell in powders. And in doing this, you have to pay a lot of attention to avoid to reach high temperature because otherwise you are going to destroy the organic matrix. So we did this process. We developed first a crushing mill, then we use a planting bowl mill in which we added several additives then kind of analytical sieve to separate the different grain sites. I told you that it's very important the dimension of the particle of calcium carbonate that you obtain. These are some of these particles that, as you can see here, this one is, it was a prism, are completely different from the biogenic one. Then what we did, some of, of these particles, no, after the treatment, were bleached, sorry. Bleach means we remove the organic material that was exposed on the surface of the particle. Why? In this way, we can improve the porosity, the surface porosity of the particle. So to make the particle more reactive. So we did all this treatment. We had the geogenic calcium carbonate as reference, and then we use Eister, Scallop, and Clam. Geogenic, bleached, so oxidizes everything which is the surface, oyster bleached, scalp bleached, clams bleached. As you can see, the percentage of calcite in the gel, we have only calcite, 99% why? Because there is 1% of silica. This is a contamination from the, the, of the geogenic calcium carbonate. Oyster and scallop remain 100% calcite. The clam, you can see, was almost completely aragonite after the ball milling, but some clam converted in calcite. So in the beginner is aragonite, but some of them it converted in calcite because, because I told you before, aragonite is thermodynamically less stable than calcite. So when you treat, a part of aragonite converts in calcite. You can see that the content of organic matrix didn't change too much before and after the bleaching. Why? Because this organic matrix is mainly intracrystalline, is inside the crystals, so it's not exposed or is only partially exposed. We measure then the, the particle size after the same grinding process, and you can see here that uh, when we move from uh, pow the grounded powder, and then we bleach the grounded powder. We use uh, an oxidative process. Some of the particles separate, producing particles of a smaller size. This is due to the organic matrix that works as link as glue and adhesive between the particles. We measure the surface area. Of course, if you reduce the particle size, From 19 to 4, the surface area increased, but not drastically. And then these are another crystallographic parameter, and I don't want to get too much in the detail. I told you that we're not going to discuss too much amorphization, but just to give you a feeling what is possible, you can see these are the fraction peak. When there is almost no fraction peak, this means the material is amorphous. So we are able also to obtain amorphous materials. Of course, this amorphous material is few ground too much. It goes to the most the thermodynamically stable phase. Now, 
if we want to use in some uh, user way calcium carbonate as filler from polymers, we have to take in consideration that polymers are made of hydrophobic material, where calcium carbonate is an hydrophilic material. So I think it's a general rule since the first year of chemistry that similar the solve similar. So if we want to make a good composite between calcium carbonate and uh, polymer, we have to convert the calcium carbonate, the, we have to transform the surface of calcium carbonate from hydrophilic to hydrophobic. How is this, this can be done? If we take uh, a, a surfactant like stearate, the surfactant, when it's in solution, they make micelles. But if we can interact with the surface of calcium carbonate, what's happening? The polar head of the surfactant will interact with the calcium carbonate, and the hydrophobic tail will be exposed. But in normal condition, when you are in a polar solvent, what's happened? The, you have one layer of surfactant interacting with the calcium carbonate, then you have the hydrophobic tail, then you make another layer of hydrophobic tail, and then you have the uh, polar head of the surfactant, which is interacting with the hydrophilic solvent. But if you treat thermally these compounds, this uh, surfactant molecule reverses this, this structure, and you get at the end an hydrophobic surface. It's clear? I hope the mechanism is clear. So we did this process, and we characterized the different scar, uh, material that we had. So we checked that it's possible to convert calcium carbonate from hydrophilic to hydrophobic, and we measured hydrophobicity as a value which is called, called contact angle. This is not so important, but in any case, higher this value, uh, closer to 180 it is, more hydrophobic is the surface. And you can see that the oyster was the material that provide, that differentiate more respect to the other materials. We also <coughs> checked the quantum of organic material before and after the treatment and other parameters. So the oyster was the material that responded better to our request. So we decided to use oyster powder. We also used two different concentrations of surfactant in solution to see if we can improve the hydrophobicity of surface, but basically we didn't get big difference when a low and high concentration of surfactant was used. We also test that surfactant was really absorbed on the surface of the crystal. This was done by uh, scanning electron microscope and also by some spectroscopic, uh, some vibrational spectroscopy disease, infrared spectroscopy. So we were sure that in this condition, we were able to surface functionalize calcium carbonate with the stearate. So this, in this condition of calcium carbonate is not anymore hydrophilic, but became hydrophobic. I'm sorry that I don't have with me a video, but this calcium carbonate, if you put in water, it's not floating down, but it's, it doesn't go down, but it's floating on the surface of water. Okay, we, this is one synthetic process. And when we did this chemical treatment, basically the polar head of the surfactor are interacting with the calcium carbonate. So the organic matrix doesn't have a key role, unless, as I told you before, after bleaching to, pro, to increase the porosity of the particles. Then we thought, we, as chemists, we know that the protein that are inside the biogenic calcium carbonate are basically made of aspartate and glutamate. And uh, I don't know how much you know about biology, but, but aspartate and glutamate expose carboxylate, carboxylic acid or carbo, carboxylate group. 
So what we did, we take advantage of the presence of carboxylic group, and we made a chemical reaction in a way that this carboxylic group could react with an amino group of this uh, dye, which is rhodamine B, and we can make a covalent bond between the biogenic calcium carbonate particles and the dye. Now, how we can test this? If we remove from the surface of the particles the carboxylate group, let's say by bleaching, by oxidation, what we expect in this case is that the amount of dye which is absorbed, having removed the carboxylic acid, should be much lower. And this is the perfect substrate because we are exactly using the same powder. So what we did, we did we bleached and then we checked the amount of dye that was linked to the surface. Of course, in the bleached is only adsorbed. In the one that was unbleached, we have a covalent bond. So we have an uh, additional source of linking. And this additional source is stable because it's a covalent bond. So you, you have to break a chemical bond. It's not just an absorption, a physical absorption. These are the one bleached, these are unbleached, so you can see basically by naked eyes that one unbleached has the color rhodamine being this violet, much more intense. Then we also quantify, and you can see here that the amount of linked rhodamine B on the surface of an oyster shell before the bleaching is much higher respect to the one we got in the bleaching, which is almost nothing. This is a functionalization of biogenic calcium carbonate, but then we decide to do something else. So we decide to mix the two phase. Functionalization by absorption, chemical functionalization. For this, we use graphene. We mix with biogenic calcium carbonate. This graphene is a, a compound made of one layer of graphite. The graphene under bone milling can interact with calcium carbonate, can mix up with the calcium carbonate, and then you get a composite material made of graphene and calcium carbonate. And this can be used because graphene, it has superior mechanical property, it's thermal conductive, and it's electrically conductive. So now we are doing some study to see how to, how to develop these materials, how to use these materials, but to give you an idea, these are particles, and you can see that there are flakes of graphene that are filled among the flakes of calcium carbonate particles. So I told you that with this process, maybe it's possible to obtain by genic calcium carbonate, which is electrically conductive, which is something really unusual. If you think a mineral, a stone, it has the capability to uh, conduce electricity. But we can also do this. How? This is another process that we develop in this project. So what we did, we take the powder, we remove the organic matrix, so we generate cavity and voids. We infiltrate the pore with a conductive, a polymer conductive polymer. So in this case, we get a conductive material. This conductive material here that I measure is really able to conduce electricity. And we use to make uh, plastics in the polymers. These are polymer conducting this uh, calcium carbonate. These polymers now electric, are electrically conductive, and then maybe they can be used to make antistatic shoes. This can be one of the potential applications that we're studying. And we prepared some materials. Of course, they are not commercial because this process costs a fortune. But we are developing this material. These are initial parting, these are the electrical conducting particles. You put inside a polymer and you can get a, a material which conduces electricity, so it can be a plastic with antistatic properties. This could be important, by instance, to make uh, sole shoes. And we use not only this, Having contact with this company, we also decide to use calcium carbonate, geogenic calcium carbonate, after the treatment 
with the uh, surfactant to make mixtures in plastic. And then we measure the mechanical property of these plastics. They tend to satisfy some aesthetic point of view that were satisfied. And what we can see, this is when we use geogenic calcium carbonate, and this is the tensing strength. So you pull the calcium, the plastic, and you see the, the highest resistance you can get. We use the same amount of calcium carbonate by shells, and you can see this value increase. We are shells that were treated in different conditions, but we are able to improve the mechanical property of the plastics. So this means that this calcium carbonate is not anymore a in high inert filler, but is a filler that can be exploited and provide better properties. Also, uh, the elongation to break increases, not only the, uh, the mechanical property, the toughness, but also the elongation to break. So you can pull more before it breaks. So in this case, it is a real property, it has a real advantage, and now the company is trying to bring this in the market. We are we are always the same problem. What is the, the cost of calcium carbonate from shells is much higher compared to the cost of calcium carbonate from queries. And in this case, we improve the mechanical properties, but improved over 10, 20%, 65%, but we don't improve 200%, 500%. So the improvement is not enough to justify the production for the market. This is something that we are always to keep in mind. When you produce new material, yeah, then you have to go to the market. And the, an increase of price of 10% is already a lot for a market. I told you before that uh, we can give high value to calcium carbonate if we convert a material for medical application. So we were able to convert calcium carbonate from oyster by some basic treatment to calcium phosphate. And they not only take advantage of the peculiar structure of the oyster, we can dope with different elements, magnesium, manganese, cadmium, erotium, terbium, calcium. So we were able to obtain materials with different composition. Some of these elements, like uh, aerobium and terbium, they are uh, photoluminescent, so you can detect the presence irradiating with UV light. This is without light, this is UV light. So you can detect and you follow the process when you use this material of reabsorption cells. And we found that this uh, oyster uh, calcium phosphate obtained particles are, uh, they, they are they are not poison for cell they stimulate cell growth so the cell this is very important and now we are going ahead with this research trying to produce more material so calcium carbonate from seashell can be converted in calcium phosphate take advantage of the higher reactivity of the calcium carbonate from the shells So we also did, this is something that I want to show you, some uh, uh, dissemination activity with this process. So we went to the school, we gave to the students shells, and uh, we asked the students how we to recycle seashell, what we will do with the seashell in the future. And we also uh, asked the student to write a poem on seashell. Of course, I'm not going to read all the poems. I'm not going to show uh, all these things, but I want to give you an idea how the kids thought you can use seashell. I'm sorry this is in Italian, but I put here some translation. For some of them, you can use to make glasses. For some of them, you can make the, the machining ads and picks for a guitar. Some you can use to make a nice nail, probably she was a, some of them you can make some uh, uh, keyboard and so on. So this project was, in, my, in our eyes, a very successful project, and we were able really to show that if we keep in mind of the presence of the organic matrix, we can produce new materials from 
cryogenic calcium carbonate. Now I close all the discussion about calcium carbonate and we start to talk about another source of chemical that you can get from waste shell, which is chitin. So now on, I will discuss of chitin. So what is chitin from the chemical point of view? Chitin is the polymer on the N-acetyl D-glucosamine. If you remove this functional group, the N-acetyl, you, you get an amino group, and this, when the amount of amino group is higher than 65%, chitin became chitosan. So basically, you have the natural polymer, which is chitin, and you can chemically treat and get chitosan. This polymeric chain of chitin can organize itself in three different ways, according to the direction. So you have alpha chitin, so one polymer chain in one direction, the following one in different directions, so forth. Beta chitin, they are all in the same direction. And there is a third way in which they can organize, which are gamma chitin, which is two in one direction, one in the opposite direction. Alpha chitin is the most stable from the thermodynamic point of view. It's widespread in nature. It makes, for instance, the acropod exoskeleton. The squid pan is less, uh, the beta chitin is less stable. It's present, by instance, in the squid pan or oligo vulgaris. And the gamma chitin is really rare and is usually associated with the cocoon of the Orchidubia. We can better understand the different reactivity between alpha chitin and beta chitin, or we can better understand the higher stability of alpha chitin if we consider the hydrogen bond. So these are the polymeric chain. You can see in the alpha chitin, there are hydrogen bonds, where these hydrogen bonds are not present in beta chitin. So the different layer of beta chitin can uh, have cleavage. So the kind of plane of cleavage that are not present in alpha chitin. So the interaction among the chain is much stronger between in alpha chitin than in beta chitin. This is due to the presence of additional hydrogen bonds. Chitin is very, very abundant in nature, not only in waste seashell. It is uh, the second polysaccharide produced in nature per year after cellulose, so about 10 or 10 tons per year. But if we consider the species that contain chitin, chitin is present in more than 70% of all the species, compared to cellulose, compared only 50%. So chitin is much more spread. We are reporting here some sample where you can find chitin. There are some fungi, there are some uh, squid pan, some shells, butterfly, and so on. Now, it's important to study how chitin fibers assemble. This is critical because if we understand how chitin fiber assemble, we can understand the mechanical properties. And for this, one of the first studies we did was to study the buccal mass of the Ariomax californicus, which is known as a, a banana slug. So all the mouth of this organism, of this slug, is made basically of chitin. And how it works? You have the slug. Yeah, this is the banana slug. You can see what the shape was called banana. Is, uh, this species lives in uh, California mainly. And you have, uh, this is the mouth. You have three main components, which are, you can see here, the jaw, the radula, and the odontophore. So the radula is on the odontophore. I don't know if you can see here, we have the jaw, the radula, and the odontophore. So when he's eating, he moves the odontophore and the radula 
from outside to inside. And these are the jaw. So you open the jaw, the radula goes out, the odontophore control the bending of the radula, and then the, the banana is able to grab leaves. It's clear? So is in this material, it's very important now to check what is the, the organization of the chitin fibers. Because according to the organization, you can have completely different property. And chitin is present in mineralized structure, can enhance the mechanical property. This is the mantle shims. It is one of the fastest and uh, harder materials in nature. But you can have also photonic properties. This is a blue butterfly. This is a bug. So here, the reflection of light is not given by the pigments, but is given by its physical light. So it's given by the structure of chitin on the surface. And this structure of chitin usually follow this process called boulevard process. You can see all the fiber are oriented, making this kind of rotation. So if, you're, if you cut now here a section, you have this view. And the photonic properties came from the distance between these layers. According to the distance, you have different diffraction light and you have different properties. Chitin, I also told you, is present in mineralized structure. These are the exoskeletons of silica, and they here control how the mineral organizes. How it occurs the biosynthesis? The organisms produce chitin, and then the chitin assembly. And when the assembly, you get all these different structure with different mechanical and uh, optical properties. So one of the issues that we try to understand is how chitin assembly. So what we did, and the, the, we had several questions. First of all, we try to address the mechanism of assembly, assembly if the protein has a role, and the chemical synthesis of natural eye organism. Okay. So this is the usual organization that you have in the squid pen. This is the squid pen. I hope that every one of you recognize your two lateral blade. And now it's organized the squid pen. You have fibers, very huge fibers. They are organized in bundles of 100 microns. Inside this bundle, you have smaller structures. Each one of these smaller structures is covered by proteins. And then if you go ahead, you, you arrive to the nanofibrils and the chitin itself. So if we are going to see from the other direction, the single molecular cells, they are parallel, you get beta chitin, they organize in nanofibrils. These nanofibrils stuck together, you have a coverage of protein, and then they start to grow always with the protein as intermediate. With one of the first questions we were asking was how protein influenced the mechanical property of the blade. Because you see here, the protein are interacting, are enveloping the fibers of uh, chitin. So we had to discover this. We did several treatments, and these treatments have different role to remove calcium ion, the DTA, or to make a, re a reduction of the disulfide bridge or to denaturate, or to remove almost completely the protein by an alkaline treatment or by an enzymatic treatment. So we did all this process, and what we then we follow this process, we are able to check when the protein were still present, when the, some of the protein were removed, when they were all removed, 
we, st we are now studying this protein, or they made this protein, these are SDS generated trophoresis. In some cases, you can see we didn't remove at all the protein. In other cases, we are able to extract some proteins. We went also to see if when we remove the proteins and we have only the chitin fibrils, this chitin changes structure, and we observe that basically the structure of the chitin remains the same over after all these treatments. So basically, when we modify the structure of the, of the protein, or we remove the protein, the framework of chitin remain almost inalterate. So now we have a material in which we have modified the protein or we have removed the protein. In this case, we can understand now better what is the role of the protein in the mechanical property of the squid pen. So we measure this mechanical property. To measure this mechanical property, we, be, we did the stress strain curve. Basically, you take a piece of the pen and you start to pull. The strain percentage means how much you elongate, and the stress gives the force that you have to apply to pull away this before it breaks. Uh, as you can see here, according to the treatment, you have a different mechanical properties. Also, the elongation, the strain changed drastically. Because why? We, don't, we didn't have the protein that works as, as glue, as it was also for the minerals. The different fiber can move one respect to each other. So this is the chitin. You can see after treatment with, with the, the squid pen without any treatment, when we remove the calcium ion with the DTA, nothing changed. When you treat with the urea, with the nitrate, it decreases a bit. When you start to remove the proteins, you can see how it dropped. When we with the mercaptate ethanol, we reduce it, the mechanical property, decrease even more, and then the, all the casistics. So basically, the organization, the protein, control the mechanical property of the squid pen. We analyze a bit better this, and then we say we for something different. Sorry, here. So now we know that this. The protein have a role in linking together the chitin chain, chitin molecule in the squid pen. But then we say we can do something different. We can be inspired by nature and maybe able to modify the chitin, chemically modify, in a way that we can have different mechanical property. And the inspiration came from the byssus. The byssus is the thread that links the muscle to the shells. It's well known that in the byssus, you have a, a metal uh, inorganic bond, a coordination bond, where the iron is linked to dop dopamine, dopamine molecules, making this coordination bond. This is not a covalent bond, this coordination bond. So if you pull away one of these molecules, you break. If you put it close by, it will reform. This gives to the uh, thread of the byssus the capability to be self-healing. So the idea was why we don't chemically link this functional group to the beta chitin, and then we measure the mechanical property. So we did all this process, and we did different control with iron, without iron. We oxidize, we reduce. So we are able to produce a chitin containing this functional group. And then we, we had iron, and we check what's happened when we put iron. If it's the, the inspiration that we take for nature, it works. When we have iron, the mechanical property has to improve. If you remove iron, the mechanical property decrease. It's, uh, I want to show you, we also demonstrate that effectively we got this functional group. And you can see when you put, this is, uh, you put iron, you can completely blue. This is a, a witness the presence of iron. 
mutate when DTA, you remove iron, becomes a colorless. We did also some other treatment. We oxidize, by instance, you put iron, you remove iron, you can see the color change completely. We put vanadium, and you can remove vanadium as well. And we follow also from Raman spectroscopy this process. I don't want to go too much in detail. As before, now if you want to make the, a control of the mechanical property, we have to, sure, to be sure that the structural organization is the same. In fact, the structural organization of chitin didn't change. It's exactly the same. But keep in mind, now this is not only pure chitin. It's chitin with a functional group of the bisous. So we learn from bisous how to use. And then we went to the mechanical test. We did a lot of tests. These are some statistical data. What we observed that when we we have iron, the mechanical property improves, the young modulus improves, but when we remove iron, it decreases. So it goes up and down. Up, you can see, with iron, without iron. With iron, without iron. So we were able to make a material which mechanical property can be drastically controlled putting iron. So we build up a new material, trying inspiration of nature. And this material was the squid pen, so a waste material. No one is using a squid pen. Good. So we saw calcium carbonate, we saw chitin. I think we go now to proteins. And uh, when I'm talking proteins, I want to talk about bisous. I already told you how to make the bisous, but now I want to explain you a bit better how it works. So the bisous is the strand that the muscle used to link to the skin. Each of these filaments contain a plaque in distal zone and proximal zone. And this is the stem one is, is extruded the bisous. So in, five, in two to five minutes, proteins are deposited in the ventral groove as liquid crystalline protein mixtures. Then these soluble precursors that are stable in acidic pH, around pH 5, they are the solidify instantaneously where are secreted outside at around pH 8, which is the pH of seawater. How is it made the bisous? The bisous is very complex structure. I show you before only one part of the bisous. This means the one that contains iron, make covalent bond with iron. But there are also other functional group, the midazole group that can coordinate zinc. And all the protein which are in the bisous are collagen-like structures. These collagen-like structure proteins interact with each other, making fibrils. And these fibrils, the code of this fibril, interacts with zinc, stabilizing, and with the iron as I showed you before. The uh, content of this different precursor change when you move from the proximal to the plaque through the distal zone. So we analyze different uh, bases. We saw that in bases we have a fibrous layer inside and an external layer, kind of cortical, which is not well uh, structured. These internal fibers are rich of this bond, while the external cortical is rich of these other bonds. The combination of all these materials provide the incredible mechanical property of the bisous and the capability of the bisous to uh, have self-healing property because you can see you, you have the usual curve stress strain, you apply stress strain, you have a point, then you release the stress, because, and the material recover its initial property. So this is very, very important because it, it means it's a self-healing. You can see even better here. You pull out, increase this distance, it's extended, it goes back, the damage point can be it can recover. 
So basically, this is the perfect self-healing material. How we can use now this byssus? Historically, the byssus from Pinna Nobilis was used as a sea silk because it has incredible optical properties. But right now, since the, P the Pinna Nobilis is a protected species, is a known species, it cannot be used anymore. And the Pinna Nobilis used this byssus to, as the root of a tree, so to anchor to substrate. Please consider these pinnas can be the size also of 50 centimeters or even more. In the past, this bisu was widely used. Now, not anymore. But then we thought the bisus from Pinna nobilis can be, cannot be used, but why? maybe we can use the bisus from mussels. And it is really a waste material, yes, because it, the production of mussel in the world, in Europe, is very high. So we, there is a lot of bisus that can be recovered. So the bisus is a waste material that so far no one considered, but it has all the potentiality to be recovered. So, and how we can use? I showed you a few slides ago that the bisus has a chemical sites where it can leak zinc and iron. And these two chemical sites are completely uh, different. Here we have DOPA and here we have histidine. So the chemical capability to interact with the metal ion is different. So why once more don't take advantage of this variability of a, a functional group? So what we did, we take the bisous. This is the bisous for muscle. We remove by treatment with the DTA all the metal ions. So this is the metal ions free bisous. And then we re-put metal and we saw that effectively the metal goes inside the bisous. Now we have a tool that showed that this bisous is able to absorb metal, but is not. the idea was it's able to absorb only metal or also other compounds. And the, the idea was why we don't use some dye, industrial dye that are usually used for in fabrics and they are released in the sea or in the water. So we use eosin and methylene blue. These two uh, dye, you can see one is positively charged, one is negatively charged. But in any case, the, the chemistry, the wide chemistry of the bisous allow these functional groups to interact with the bisous. Okay, so we use this bisous and we were going to test if it has really the ability to absorb this dye. So it can be used for water remediation. So this is the starting solution that we have. We put bisous in each one of these solutions. So this here, let's say this is the eosin at a different concentration. This is the blue methylene at different concentrations. We put bisous, and you can see that after a while, in the final solution, changed drastically the color. This means that the, the dye was, in this case, was completely removed. And you can see the bisous compla the, got completely red. So this means it absorbed completely the dye. If we then we treat in acidic condition this bisous, the dye can be recovered, uh, can be removed and recovered, the bisous can be used once more. The same effect was observed with the blue methylene. Also in this case, you can see the bisous removed completely the dye from the water. So we have really high capability of the bisous to remove this dye. So it can really be used as uh, in water remediation to treat polluted water and to remove the dyes. We also studied the kinetic process to see which kind of, to understand better the genetics, the mechanism, and the, all this absorbing profile 
where well described by Friedrich is a term or die are is a term, which means that we have a kind of interaction which is not really specific. It's not just the Langomere interaction, we have site by site interaction, but of course, less specific sites. So it's possible that you have a different way of interacting of these uh, functional groups, these dye groups with the eosin or with the DOPA. So we have, we know how potentially this dye can interact with the uh, waste basis. So waste basis can be used in water remediation. We can also maybe use in different way. And uh, one thing that came out in our in our lab is that we know that the basis is a composite material. It has an external cuticle and internal fibers. And maybe these fibers, which are responsible for the mechanical property, can be separated and reused. Maybe we can reuse this fiber to make porous matrix. So the basic idea was to separate the cuticle from the from the fibers region, and then to use these fiber regions, we were able to separate. We follow this by uh, optical microscopy and by atomic force microscopy. These are images of these fiber fibers that were separated, and maybe we can reuse this fiber. So we cast when we got this fiber, we cast the fiber. So they are not anymore now separate fiber, but they are material. And this material it has high porosity. And then we treated these materials with the three metal ions, iron, zinc, and copper. And we can see that all these materials, it have high capability to absorb this, uh, uh, these metal ions. So what means this? That the, the this kind these proteins that make the basis can be used for water remediation not only of dye but also of synthetic uh, of uh, metal ions. So it's a, a, a one pot system that can clean up water from dye and from metal ions. And when we treat with metal ions, we can remove the metal ions by ADTA treatment. And so we have again the matrix that can be reused. We stain this uh, matrix to understand how they were organized and how the different protein they uh, structured each other. We also did the Raman spectrum to see if the metals goes where the metal goes and how it interacts with the matrix. We said we can use it for porous matrix, but it's very important that these porous are, are stable in water because you, we have to put in, in the dye loading. So we also check the amount of water around the time that this matrix can absorb. And according to amount of water, we also measure the loading of different ions. So this matrix, when they are in water, they are swollen and they are able to absorb metal ions. We treat when DTA, we remove the metal ions. We also made measurements of the mechanical properties of this porous matrix. They are the usual curve, stress strain, we know already. This is the general trend. It's not really an elastic material, as you can see, and after a while it breaks. But if you are going now to focus in the starting range here in this region, you can see the mechanical properties are different and the metal treated material is, it has an elastic module. This means the force that you have to apply to have the same deformation, which is higher compared to the one where the metal has been depleted. So the metal is effectively anchoring the protein molecules, making this material more resistant. This is 
Then we said, but you know, water remediation is important. But I told you in the beginning, our goal is biomedical application. Can we use this for biomedical application as a porous matrix, matrix on which the cell can grow? And this was done, and we also observed that cells are growing very well on this porous matrix at the time. So this porous matrix made by the bees, which has good mechanical property, are biocompatible because they are made of protein, can be a good substrate also for self-growth. So, in conclusion, the chemical and physical property of the bees substrate or matrix are metal ion concentration dependent. The color of the bees substrate and matrices are dependent on metal ion species content. So if you want to use for some, even for some other application. The business thread can be used for diverse applications. Water remediation is one of these. Business matters show biocompatibility. It can be prepared and blended with other biopolymers. Reusing business waste is a perfect example of circular economy because it's waste that no one considers. As BISO is a valuable biomaterial, not only does it improve the sustainability in aquaculture industry, but can provide a secondary economic benefit to shell field growers and processors as well. So no one has used the BISOs as substrate for a biomedical application. No one has used so far the BISOs to produce new materials. So with this slide, I finished my lectures. So we stop here because as I told you, I'm fortunate to go. So you are free, and but before this, I will be glad to answer a question from you. Um, there's just one question. Um, not right. The basis is not worked in terms of scientific research, right? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I could not hear. Uh, the basis. Mm -hmm. It's not worked uh, in scientific research because artisanally there's one person in Sardinia allowed to do that. Uh, the basis so far is widely studied from the chemical and physical point of view. There is a group in uh, in Canada, which is uh, at McGill University, is doing a lot of research on basis. There are also people in Sardinia. There is a lady, which, I don't know if you are referring to Chiara Vigo. Yeah, yeah, that's Chiara Vigo, sì. Yeah, Chiara Vigo is a good friend of mine. We collaborate a lot. And we were studying uh, how Chiara Vigo treats the bisous with, our, with her, uh, my, I'd say, magic hands in some way. And we, you know, at this I want to tell you what we did. And when we start to work with the bisous, I contacted Chiara Vigo, and uh, she said to me that uh, she's got, she, was, she showed me everything she does, step by step, all her secret. But they are secrets. For this, I could not discuss with you about the business from Pina Nobilis. Okay? <laughs> okay. Spoke, I have to tell you, but I can tell you some things more. Because uh, uh, to this project, I involved some colleagues from the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. So me, I flew to Cagliari, me and Chiara went in Berlin, and we went in kind of a uh, recording room, you know, with a lot of webcams, sensor of temperature, sensor of humidity. So we were recording everything Chiara was doing to try to understand chem chemically what's happened. And we answered a lot of questions of what chemically happened. Mm -hmm. So we know almost all the process from the chemical point of view. The main problem is that we we're, were not able to reproduce what Chiara does at 100%. We never get the material with the same properties of the Chiara ones. So I don't know what is the, I mean, Chiara was doing by, with her hands, it's some kind of sensibility that you cannot transmit with the, the most powerful, uh, uh, IR uh, webcam that control the temperature of the ends when she's moving the basis, all these things. This is kind of mystery that still we have to discover. But by the way, I don't know if you are from Sardinia. Chiara is a good friend of mine. Nice. 
So Chiara was really open with us. She flew with us in Berlin. We, we record, I have still the movie, or everything what she was doing. But I promised Chiara that I was not showing to anyone. Okay. You are from Sophia, if you know Chiara. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of our colleagues knows her. That's, that's why the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do okay, I'm sorry, but in, as I told you now, I cannot stay with you more time because I'm in the Italian embassy in Tel Aviv. So we are a bit linked to some rules here, security rules. Okay, it was a pleasure to meet all you. Uh, please send me an email if you have any question, even if some doubts are coming on. And I will share with uh, Stefano, with uh, Mauro, uh, the slides of the presentation so you can have in a few days. Okay, thank you very much. Professor. Yeah, sorry, but six I have to go. I don't want to get close, don't to be get close inside. No problem. Thank six, you. Lo local time, not in your time. Okay, enjoy your afternoon. Bye. Bye. Ciao, Mauro. Ciao. <laughs> Mauro left. Professor Marini is not there. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's upstairs working. Uh, Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Guys, with the communication. So, last year, uh, me and some other